Today's webinar is Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Transforming the Industrial Estate. Nicholas Ashford and Ralph Hall will share their experience in teaching their graduate level course in Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Transforming the Industrial State at MIT, Virginia Tech, Harvard, and Cambridge University, and the Technical University of Cyprus, using their revised textbook of the same name. This transdisciplinary text addresses both national and international policies needed to promote sustainable development, which rest on three pillars. One, delivering essential goods and services to people. Two, maintaining a good environment. And three, creating meaningful opportunities for sufficient earning capacity for people through employment and other ways to broaden capital ownership. Conventional theories of economic growth, consumption, employment, and inequality are challenged, and a more modern conceptualization of the workings of the industrial state, both developed and developing, is presented. The transformation of the industrial state will be enabled by environmental economic and trade law new economics and a more realistic political theory focused on achieving an equitable and secure society in a resource and energy constrained future. The book was written specifically to enable a more integrated and transdisciplinary approach in teaching sustainable development. Nicholas Ashford is Professor of Technology and Policy and Director of the Technology and Law Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he teaches courses in environmental law, policy, and economics, law, technology, and public policy, and uh, technology, globalization, and sustainable development. Dr. Ashford holds both a PhD in chemistry and a law degree from the University of Chicago, where he also received graduate education in economics. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Ralph Hall is associate professor in the School of Public and International Affairs at Virginia Tech, where he is director of the SPIA undergraduate program. Dr. Hall's research and teaching focus on sustainable development, sustainable transportation, and water supply and sanitation in developing countries. <clears throat> Dr. Hall holds a PhD in technology management and policy and two SM degrees in technology and policy and civil and environmental engineering from MIT. He also holds a Master's of Engineering and Civil Engineering from the University of Southampton. With that, uh, I think we have already switched over and everyone should be able to see Ralph Hall's screen. So I will um, turn it over to Nicholas and Ralph uh, right now. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Ira. Uh, we, as, you indicate, as you had indicated, <clears throat> we developed this book to teach an integrated approach to sustainable development and hope that those of you that have more expertise in one aspect of sustainable development, like environment or economic development, will benefit and feel uh, courageous enough to attempt either individually or in team teaching the materials in this text which we feel are imperative and connected in order for a state developing or developed to achieve sustainable development. So the next um, picture is just simply how this business started. Uh, in 2011, we published the first edition um, incorporating some of the work of, of um, Ralph Hall as he was getting his PhD. Seven years later, we felt that a, a rewrite was necessary because so much had happened in uh, sustainable development and so much new writing and thinking had happened that um, a new view of the problem emerged. And while Ralph and I are the senior editors of this particular text, uh, we want to acknowledge the assistance of both Charles Keldart with whom I teach environmental law, and Robert Ashford at Syracuse University College of Law, who has worked on um, increasing the, uh, uh, the economic um, uh, options available to working people to increase 
of their earning capacity. So uh, we start with the conception of what the economy is like. And uh, you might find this introduction in any environment, uh, economic development course. There's a supply side of the economy, uh, which most industrial or industrializing societies have, ranging from extraction issues of oil and materials to manufacturing to um, transportation and the other uh, activities, which really are responsible for uh, environmental pollution. I mean, transportation, agriculture, housing, and food production really are the major sources of compromises, both to uh, ecosystem integrity and to the use of energy, which we now are really uh, concerned with. The, there's the supply side of the economy, and there's the demand side of the economy, and of course, three different groups uh, buy things that the economy has produced, individual consumers, uh, economic entities, where most of the economic exchange occurs, actually, and then the government itself as a purchaser of materials and things which benefit the society. Now, the, the obsession or, or preoccupation uh, with the uh, supply and demand side picture is that uh, economists want to achieve equilibrium. That is, there should be either be an absence nor uh, an oversupply of the essential goods and services. And that operates under the assumption that the supply side of the economy operates independent from the demand side. But as this first addition to the slide indicates, and as Kenneth Galbraith has written so eloquently upon, of course, the demand side and the supply side are not independent. There's producer-created demand primarily through advertising, which encourages people and institutions to buy more than they otherwise might buy. That's not the only distortion of the supply and demand side equilibrium. Uh, there's the role of finance, which turns out to be absolutely crucial to understand and to change. There are subsidies for production. We all know that agricultural subsidies, fossil fuel production uh, subsidies as well. But there's also credit given for producers and providers of services to do more. And there's credit given to consumers uh, to, to uh, uh, increase the debt that they have. And so you have the supply side and the demand side, which is bolstered artificially by uh, both private sector and uh, private and public sector activities. Uh, and if you have too much pressure increasing the supply and too much pressure increasing the demand, um, you elevate the equilibrium point to what's called the pseudo equilibrium point and eventually the system can, can really collapse in what other people have called a bubble what Stieglitz calls the bubble and what Robert Ayers, uh, the energy economist, has identified as a bubble. And we have now in the process perhaps creating yet another bubble. Now, on the supply side, of course, one would stop a minute and ask, well, what is it that are the factors of production that are used in the context of generating the products of the industrial state? And you see them all here, beginning with land, which dominated during the colonial period. But uh, the things which are bolded, natural and physical capital, energy, physical labor, and intellectual know-how, as well as now inter the uh, ICT contributions of information and communication technology, those are the things which, uh, which the private sector controls. They will use a mix to their advantage of the factors of production. And um, when that we observe, the only thing we observe is that there's a tremendous volatility in the cost or the prices of these essential factors of production. But also, every single one of them, as well as the ones that basically the government is responsible for, like built capital, all of them do not contain the uh, what's called the negative externalities, which involve unaccounted for harm to the environment and to human labor. And so if all of the factors of production are basically underpriced, then uh, one could ask the rhetorical question, well, what kind of an equilibrium are we talking about? 
Number one, first, the one that's distorted by advertising and financial uh, tinkering. And secondly, one in which the factors of production, which the state and the private sector deals with, do not even include the real costs. So uh, the whole model of reaching an equilibrium and devising policies for a equilibrium model, which does not represent real costs and does not reflect the fact that supply and demand are not independent, uh, should raise one's eyebrows uh, as to how useful that model is. So continuing uh, on the sophistication, which is necessary, of course, the, the, the economy with contributions from supply and demand has created some sustainability challenges. And these are, these challenges are the focus of the text, along with the solutions that we see as options for addressing the problem in a better way. First, there is the question of what the economy supplies. And the very first thing under sustainability challenges is the fact that we observe that many countries have an inadequate supply of and access to essential goods and services. And we underscore essential. It's not just that anybody can have whatever they want. There's requirements for caloric intake, for housing, for shelter, for security. And unlike other people who talk about the economy, we argue that the essential purpose of an industrial system is to increase the supply and access to essential goods and services. A country which has an ever increasing number of people below the poverty line cannot be said to be sustainable. A sustainable society is one which leaves increasingly fewer and fewer people out of the benefits of that society. And then there is the demand side of the question, because the, the, the first is the supply side, where you have to have people who buy these goods and services have to have enough purchasing power and earning capacity, much of which may come today from labor, but which may increasingly need to come from other ways of wealth transfer, that if we do not have enough of the right kind of well-paying work uh, involved with the society and other means of ownership, then you can't balance the supply and the demand. And so the, the, it is essential that we separate the supply and demand because different policies will address that inadequacy. And then uh, the next five entries are in green appropriately because they have to do with the environment. Now, if you look at the first one, which is resource depletion, and you were to Google environmental economics, over three quarters of the sources and papers would be talking about the allocation of essential uh, resources and inputs. And uh, classically, environmental economics has been uh, preoccupied with resource depletion. But of course, increasingly, we understand the adverse effects on the environment aside from depleting resources, and that is the ecosystems are disrupted as habitats are destroyed, increasing toxic pollution in water, air, waste, and the like. And now in the most recent and, and dominant discussion, the issue of climate disruption and climate change. And those four major contributions to environmental problems, of course, are all related. They're related to the workings of the industrial state. And so we add a fifth one called environmental injustice, reflecting the fact that it seems to be the poor communities and the poor nations which have more than their share of environmental problems, and they are the last to receive adequate financial and political attention. So what we've done now so far is to talk about the supply of essential goods, the uh, wherewithal with which to buy those essential goods, the externality problem of harm on the environment, and then finally, a very important factor, which is what starts the difficulty that we find ourselves in, the crisis that we find ourselves in, is an inappropriately designed financial system, both domestic and global. So if we look at the uh, state that we're in right now, we are in a crisis. Uh, we, you might say there's even a perfect storm there's a reinforcement of bad outcomes in the six major areas that define an economy. The financial system, 
the wealth and income concentration, which has become more exacerbated, you know, Piketty's work on wealth concentration and um, others, employment challenges, and on both sides of the Atlantic, at least, we're having a crisis in employment. People are not able to earn the kind of money they used to be able to earn, and it may not even be the case that enough jobs will be created, even by the optimistic uh, perspective perspectives on information and communication technology. Beyond employment, of course, <clears throat> which is linked to the ability of, a, of enough people to consume, if consumption is uh, not adequate, then industry itself will not be able to invest and produce uh, goods which could satisfy the need for essential essentiality. Now, it is said that the private sector is awash with cash. It, it doesn't increase its expansion uh, of, of, of investment because there's nobody to buy the products of the industrial state. And in fact, it's purchasing its own shares back, which, which uh, put pressure on increasing the value of those shares, which exacerbates the inequality of wealth to begin with. If you just introduce a factor which is more demand for shares, even if it's from the existing shareholders, you're basically going to increase the price of the stock. And so the difference between people who own a lot of stock, and in this country, the 50% of people who own not very much, if any, is tremendous. And so the, the continual movement between um, those with high incomes and those with low incomes continues to be a problem. And then finally, if we do want to take the environment seriously, and sustainable development for many begins with the concern with the environment, either global climate change or toxic substances or the like. But at the end of the day, when people don't have adequate purchasing power to buy essential goods, you could very well ask the rhetorical question, how likely is it that we do the investment that's needed to improve the environment? And so these six factors are really the essentialities of the workings of the industrial state and we have a perfect storm because starting with the inappropriate financial system, we have caused a system which has got basically negative um, feedback loops to create a worse than you could even hope to design in a movie, uh, a, a perfect storm. And that's what we have. Now, in addition to worrying about those issues, of course, there's the general observations <coughs> that the knowledge base leads to inadequate solutions. If only chemical engineers were worried about chemistry and lawyers only worried about lawsuits and economists only worried about economic development, you're obviously gonna get a, a set of, of policy recommendations which do not do the trick. Uh, we have outlived our period of, uh, of, of, of fragmented knowledge. Even the universities, the private firms and the governments by separating interests in labor, engineering, science, uh, business, uh, we, we fail to see the interconnectedness of these major factors. And then from a political perspective, <clears throat> because of the, the, uh, because of the um, inequity in wealth and economic welfare, there is an inequality to economic and political power and the agenda is captured by a relatively few number of either people or uh, private sector entities. And that capture does not uh, deliver benefits to the entire society. There is a tendency towards a, work, a root word that I coined from the Greek, gerontocracy. You can guess what it means. It means governance by the old. And generally, it's old ideas. But I also hesitate, but I will add the fact it's also usually Old, old men as well that tend to run the society. And I think we're now in a period where we're starting to understand the very importance of a balanced um, autocracy. Now, in addition to these problems, we don't seem actually to be able to appropriately reform the financial system. Uh, we still have not only banks too, too large to fail, but too large to jail. And in Europe, the Euro uh, system is in real crisis uh, with the possible exit of the British from the European uh, uh, Union. It may actually cause a collapse of not only the Euro financial system, but a collapse 
of the uh, <clears throat> European Union completely. We are not in a stable situation. And then finally, we seem to have culturally an addiction to growth. Everybody thinks growth has to be what it is. It has to be improved if you call yourself an industrial state. And we have a high throughput industrial system. These are problems which are fundamental and need to be changed if we're going to be able to, uh, to address them seriously. And we've, uh, we have a vision of sustainable development, which, is, uh, which may help this. So on the next slide, uh, before we, we identify, we go to the, the image of the sustainable development, uh, sustainable society. Uh, these are the solutions that you'll find at the end of the book. That is, one is that uh, there are a whole variety of, of, of stakeholders, industry, government, people involved with education, uh, NGOs, unions, the international community, and on, you'll find these tables in the back of the book, each with each recommendations of possible things that the various shareholders can do to promote more sustainable industrial production and consumption, sometimes described as the circular economy so that we use much less material and energy. And then there is another set of policies that directly go to improving health, safety, the environment, and global climate impacts. And they involve regulation. They involve both domestic and international regulation as well for Europe as the uh, European regulatory system, which might very well be a model for other, um, uh, other groups of economic activity like South America or a, the Asian Pacific region and so forth, that the more integration of regulatory systems, the better. And then there is the issue that we've already identified that you have to have meaningful, rewarding and safer employment, creating enough earning capacity. And that needs to include uh, expanding the ownership basis of the society. Uh, the next set of fundamentals is that you cannot do this without paying attention to trade. Very many people will look at economic development without addressing the issue of trade, but we see both from the American uh, changes in this administration, but also all of Europe now very, very concerned about the trade issue in China. So we have to deal with the trade as part of an explicit industrial policy and embark on a deliberate strategy to decrease unsustainable growth. Uh, obviously, some people need to consume more, some people need to consume less, but growth ought not to be the preoccupation of the industrial state. So with that having been talked about, uh, let me introduce uh, a little bit of optimism in a sense. Uh, Kondratiev has these waves of technological change which Schumpeter picks up. He talks about the waves of creative destruction. And if you look at the first four waves, you'll see that they are largely dependent on energy and the involvement of mechanical and chemical engineering. And we've always had a boom and a bust. Uh, first, we, things got bad, and then the new technology came in. And, and things have always been better. And there are those optimists that believe, uh, like Carlotta Perez, the uh, well-known uh, Venezuelan economist, who thinks that we're on the fifth uh, wave, uh, which will create a, a, a new boom. And we don't have to worry about anything with the proviso that we go green. Uh, we're of the view that going green, of course, is really good, but it may not be enough. And other people have voiced that concern that going green is not enough. And the thing about the fifth wave, which is fundamentally based on artificial intelligence and um, information communication technology, is it's not based on energy. In fact, our ability to, to, uh, to, to get to extract the energy from the remaining inefficiencies in the energy system, as Robert Ayers has talked about, is getting harder and harder and harder. So if you believe that the fifth wave will take care of everything and we don't need to worry about anything, uh, your optimism is on firmer ground than ours. Because I, we name, we, the ICT revolution and the uh, artificial intelligence revolution may not, as Brynjolfsson and Akafi in their book, The Second Machine Age, talk about, may not create enough well-paying jobs 
for people basically to be able to buy essential goods. Then, you know, we'll leave that to your own belief system and view of the facts. So um, at that point, probably it's a good idea to, to uh, turn this over to uh, Ralph, uh, who will talk about our, uh, the way we look at sustainable development, which is a little bit different than other people do. Ralph, why don't you take over from here? Ralph? Nicholas, well, I, he may have dropped off. All right. Um, I can continue for a while, if you like, until he comes in to uh, pick it up. Be, yeah, why don't, uh, why don't you continue uh, until we see right. and come back yeah, on? I don't, I, don't, I don't have the slides in front of me anymore, so we have to fix that glitch. Can we, can we do that, Ira? I am going to change the presenter role over to you. Do you have slides on your desktop? Um, do I have? Yes, I do. Okay. So, um, you want me to put them on? Yeah. If you just put your slides on your desktop and accept the presenter role, um, I just okay. sent the prompt over to you. Okay, one second. I will put the, um, hopefully put it as soon as I can. Oh, one second. Hmm. Nope. Pictures of us will not satisfy anybody's Curiosity, I'm afraid. Ah, here it is, slides, okay. Um, you should have presentation coming up. I will speed ahead to where he was going to take over, hoping he can join us. Can you see what I see or not? I'm my box is still saying waiting to view Nicholas Ashford's screen, so I don't see your screen yet. Right, still it it, it didn't connect yet. Let me just see. Try again. And apologies to our listeners. Okay. Okay, it's circling, but it doesn't seem to want to. Ah, fine. Okay, so let me skip ahead, right? Because we don't need those issues. Hang on. Um, that's not. It's too far. Okay, that's why we would have had him. It's basically uh, our scheme. What do we mean by sustainable development? Okay, and um, what we do mean by that? Okay, here we go. Oh, sorry. Oh, 
reminds of when people use trouble PowerPoint that uh, power is uh, power color up corrupts in absolute power. PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, but uh, okay, here we are. Technological change and globalization, that is trade, <clears throat> are considered the drivers of change within and between the operationally important dimensions of sustainability. And these are the, um, these are the essential um, elements, the economy, of course, the environment, of course, and work. And we put work rather than social concerns because work is the means by which purchasing power has been up to this time exercised. Why separate work from the economy? The reason for separating work, which of course is, is part of the economy, is that the policies and the uh, determinants of the nature of employment is not just up to the government or up to the private sector, but it's also part of a social event and a social contract. And the policies that you would want to increase employment uh, may not even be consonant with the policies that you want to uh, increase the profits. That is, profits may have to decrease in some sectors in order to increase, increase more, uh, more employment. In fact, we're seeing that because the pressures are to destroy employment with the present industrialization. Now, the troublesome realities are <clears throat> that jobs are being polarized. As Brynjolfsson and McAfee talked about, job polarization and the hollowing out of the middle class is a warning for what's going to be happening with the new technologies. And if you look at the data, <clears throat> you see the, the diversion between family income, private employment, per capita GDP, and labor productivity. Labor productivity, well, productivity is a ratio. It is the ratio of output by all factors of production divided only by what you pay or give to labor. And you see, you can make the economy more profitable, but you will decrease employment in the process. And so while it sounds really great that countries are doing well by improving labor productivity, it should not be confused with, with a term which means completely something else, labor productiveness. Labor productiveness is the act of being productive. Labor is productive, capital is productive, energy is productive, and as we will say later, these are independent sources of improving productiveness. And if you just improve the output by a process which destroys labor, labor productivity goes up, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing. So what Brynjolfsson and, uh, and company talk about is the fact that uh, is the fact that you uh, you you have uh, this decoupling of work and profit, and then uh, if you look at uh, the distribution of changes in employment by major occupational category between 1979 and 1912, uh, go to you go to the right and you increase the time. In a variety of occupations, you see, we're basically changing the nature in which the uh, uh, productivity of the middle class, right, has gone, has, it may have gone up because there's less workers. But instead of having a single distribution of professions, you've got high earning professions, you've got low earning professions, and we've got the disappearance of the middle class that is talked about by Brynjolfsson and um, McAfee. Now, um, so here we have the middle skills, the high skills, the low skills. Nicholas, is just, yeah. we, we can uh, hear you loud and clear, but we uh, never did get to see your slides. I did write oh. uh, an email to Ralph asking him to log back in. Um, and I know that we'll be getting your slides afterwards. And so I've reassured people in the chat box that uh, we will post all the slides later. But uh, I, I would like you to continue. Uh, I just wanted you to be aware that we're, we're not seeing the slides. You could just uh, uh, let me, describe. Let me, talk, you, let me tell you what the slides say. Yeah, exa exactly. Slides. Yeah. In Thank one you. case, the, the slides talk about an improvement 
in profit and what's called labor productivity, which means you produce more goods with the same labor or you produce um, many more goods with less labor. Uh, but that doesn't mean that labor gets a share of the, of the, uh, of the profits and the improvements in the industrial state. That's the first slide. The second slide, which you haven't seen, is the distribution of employment between low-skilled workers, middle-skilled workers, and highly paid workers. And as I think you may know from uh, other discussions, uh, we are basically moving towards a small number of very highly paid, highly skilled workers, and a larger number of low-skilled and poorly paid workers, and the middle class is disappearing. Basically, the middle class is disappearing. That's what that slide shows. Okay, now, um, so the, this job polarization is a real event. 94% of net employment growth in the US economy from 2005 to 2015 appeared to occur in what are called alternative work arrangements. That is what's called contingent work. It's temporary work. Um, so uh, let me, I don't know what happened to the slide, sorry. I'm going back to it, even though you can't uh, see it, okay? I did hear from uh, Ralph, by the way, Nicholas, uh, that they've had a complete Wi-Fi and Ethernet outage at Virginia Tech, so um, he's trying to resolve that problem. Okay, I will try to be as um, clear about things as I can while you have can the you hear Yes. Okay, I'm on my. I'm, I've joined via my cell phone here. Um, I apologize. We we had a complete. Uh, system outage and so I have my tech support guy here and we're we're trying to work on it but the whole building was out so I hope to be able to rejoin via the computer shortly so Nick if you could carry on just for a moment I do apologize hopefully I can jump back on uh, shortly okay so I've talked about two slides which the audience can't see okay then there is a third slide which talks about the um, distribution of income, uh, of course, this, by the way, the change in low and middle and high wage occupation occurs in Europe as well. This is not just an American phenomenon. It's an industrial production phenomenon. And it turns out that uh, routine work is basically disappearing. Non-routine work is increasing and uh, non-routine cognitive and manual work is increasing. But the routine work that, used, that employed a lot of people is basically disappearing. And that happens to be a universal, at least from a European uh, US perspective, uh, problem. So uh, we've had a three decade declining labor share of total income. And so in this third graph, will show how the corporate profits have gone up and how wages as a percentage of GDP has gone down. So you find this, this basically dispersion while, while the, the share that goes to labor uh, has decreased tremendously and the share that goes to corporate profit has increased. And this is not a nasty statement about corporations. This is simply a description of what it is that's happened. Uh, Autar, who's a well-known economist here at MIT, uh, has done some very nice work which showed that in the six leading sectors in the United States, whereas the labor share used to be 50%, it's now shrunk to 33% in the major firms that dominate six of the major sectors. So it is really not, a, not an illusion that labor is doing less and less uh, of the work. Um, Byra, are you there? I'm still no. there, and now okay. we can see slides because uh, I have shifted the presenter role back to Ralph, 
and I think we just saw his slides. Hopefully, it'll come back. There it is. Very good. He's got, yeah, he's got to move on to those three slides, which I went through verbally. Uh, if you look at them in a second, you should be able to. Yeah. That's the last slide I showed, which is labor share decreasing and mentioning author's work. That's what we're faced with on both sides of the Atlantic. Labor share is decreased, which means purchasing power has decreased. That's the problem. Now, if you're an optimist and you think that artificial intelligence and advances in computer technology is going to create more workers, then you would be in good company with the four prior um, industrial waves. But uh, there are those of us that don't think it's the same situation anymore. We don't think we're going to have large, well-paid employment. Ralph, do you want to take it over from here? Ralph? Or shall I continue? Why don't you continue, Nicholas? All right. All right. I guess one cannot predict outages, except that you can. We know they're going to happen. <laughs> oh, I lost my slides. Can you I hear me? Yeah, but we lost your slides. Yeah, sorry, I had to, I was talking, but nothing was happening. So let me see <laughs> if, this, if this works. Okay, good. Um, so I'm assuming you can hear me now. I again, apologize for the technical problems here. Um, so for everybody listening, the slides here are, I'm not sure if Nick mentioned, but they are available on my website. If you type in ralphphall.com and go to presentations, that you can find a link to these slides there in case we have further technical problems. So the one of the, um, the descriptions of why these, these changes are happening um, is we have open trade, financial openness, uh, growing automation, labor union decline, and other factors. And one of the things that um, I will say a few words about here is that when we have growing automation, as production becomes more capital intensive, so will the earnings distribution. So people will earn an income from their, their wages, but if, as you can see from the blue graph here, if um, wages are a declining share of GDP uh, and greater proportion of GDP is going to those owning capital, we need to think differently about how perhaps wealth is distributed um, in our economies. We also need to think about the increasing cost of living. And I'm sure as many of you know, at least if you're based here in the US, relative to growth in employee earnings, you see a, a significant growth in the premiums uh, for family coverage in terms of health insurance. And when I was uh, talking about this with my students recently, uh, one of them put forward a more uh, interesting graph, which has a lot more information on it. And you can see here the, the price changes from 1997 to 2017. And obviously things in red are going up and things in blue are stable or, or have declined in that time frame. What's interesting is the non-tradables or services um, have increased significantly. So healthcare, as shown in the previous graph, college tuition, uh, childcare services. Uh, wages are there sort of in the middle. So there has been some improvement, but it's the tradables and manufactured goods where they have been, where there has been competition, which are, have essentially stayed level or have seen significant declines in their price. So we have seen this increasing cost of living and we have felt it. And if we haven't had a corresponding increase in, in wages, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw the graphs earlier, but essentially, if you look at increase in family income, what, what we see is the 10 percentile, 50 percentile levels from the 1960s until today have been relatively flat, whereas it's the 90th percentile of income earners which have seen increases. And so we've got this growing income inequality um, and wealth concentration happening. And we can see that through a series of, of graphs here. This is the, the sort of a nice hockey stick curve of a snapshot of wealth distribution in the US in 2016. Uh, 
you know, you've, I'm sure many of you have heard the 10%, 5%, 1%, 0.1% uh, containing the vast majority of wealth uh, in the US and in other uh, countries in the world. And this graph shows you that it is the top 10% that essentially hold the vast majority of wealth. If you look at um, the changes in, in family wealth over time, this is from 63 until basically 2016, what you notice here is it's, it changes by um, race and ethnicity. So the, the growth in income that has been experienced in the 90th percentile of income earners is predominantly by these two graphs shown that it's benefiting the, the white, um, white ethnic group, whereas black and Hispanics are generally flat. So the growth that is occurring and, and the benefits that are being accrued by increased wages are not being distributed evenly across um, ethnic groups. We also have information and statistics like this one, which is quite staggering. This came out in the Davos, around the Davos meeting earlier this year, and essentially it says that if you look at the total wealth generated in 2017, 82% of that wealth went to 1% of the global population. So four-fifths of the wealth created essentially went to 1%. And so if that's, if that's true, um, and it's happening year on year, it tells you there's a jet stream of wealth out there, but the vast majority of that is not um, reaching the sort of 99% of the global population. And there's other work you can start thinking about in this context, and a Nobel Prize economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz talks about how inequality and unearned income, so income from this capital ownership, um, model can kill the economy, it can kill opportunities for significant economic development. And the final point here is that um, the, the economy has unutilized productive capacity. We could produce more stuff if people had the, uh, had the income um, effective demand to purchase it. Now all of these troublesome realities are connected, they're, they're interrelated, and you know, the problem is not really the technological ability to produce more. The problem is really to do so profitably, equitably, and sustainably. And that's really what um, Nick and I have been trying to advance in, in this textbook. Um, the, the book is rather comprehensive, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, one of the things that, that um, Iris spoke about in the introduction was sort of pedagogy, content, and leadership. I think what we're what we're talking about at this moment is content, and one of the things we talked about extensively when trying to publish the first edition and second edition of this work was whether to break up the book into several books or to keep it as one. We've strongly argued for the need to keep the work as an integrated whole, and hopefully we'll we'll explain that more as we go. But you know, if you think about the challenges we're looking at. We've sort of presented so far environmental challenges and, and inequality challenges. So on the left here, you have the classic ice hockey stick um, global warming curve. And on the right, you've got the, the graph I just showed you about uh, 2016 um, wealth across percentiles in the US. Now, one of the things that I think I'm very concerned about is what happens if we actually can solve or significantly address the environmental concerns we're facing. Now, the ice hockey stick curve for climate change could be replaced by a ice hockey stick curve for plastic in oceans or brominated fire retardants in, in wildlife, for example, in killer whales. So the challenge is this, that the currently discussed long-term solutions that, it, that are available, particularly in the US and EU context, tend to promote um, advanced technology efficiencies as the way forward. Given the data, which we've shown half of, of what we were going to show, but given, given this, um, hollowing out of the middle class and the sort of polarization of the workforce and the, the important dominant perhaps role now of automation and, and technology capital in displacing work, the solution to some of the sustainability environmental problems we're looking at could undermine the viability of a, a working-based way of distributing wealth in, in an economy. 
So, you know, one of the things Nick and I will maybe come back to today is, is this major problem that the solutions to sustainability from an environmental perspective could end up undermining how we can address the inequality question. So um, we have sort of anchored our framing of sustainable development using this, this diagram. And just before my internet connection was lost, um, one of the things we would have done is raise a question, and I'm not sure if Nick mentioned this, was the need to separate work from the economy. And the previous sequence of graphs and information hopefully made a case as to why it's really important to do that. Because if you address environmental problems and also try and stimulate economic development, but don't pay attention to the availability of meaningful, well-paid employment, you could undermine everything you're doing because people won't be able to live um, by their incomes. Um, so Nick, do you want to say a few words about the, the structure of this? Um, I'm almost afraid to take over the slides. <laughs> you want to continue? I can continue. Well, as you'll see, I'll bring them all up here. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what we do, this, this image here is essentially chapter five in the book. So the way we sort of have structured the book is to begin with why are we concerned about the future? We talk about the history of sustainable development. We then move into economic theories, theories of globalization, um, and then get to chapter five, which is sort of this integration of all these ideas that we've talked about. So you can in some way think about chapters one through five as being the providing many of the theoretical foundations upon which the rest of the book is built. Why, so, why, don't, I, why don't I describe this? Just leave your slides. I will not touch the slides. Yeah, go um, ahead. All right. So, so one of the big questions that we want to ask, because you want to get beyond generalities to really understand. First, these are the four concerns of the environment, including environmental justice that we're concerned about. And what we do first is we relate things that occur in the economy to things that happen in the environment. And there are three major determinants of the environmental consequences of industrialization. One is just more development, more industry, more technology basically will continue to harm the environment. You may have heard of the Kuznets curve, which argues that as a country gets more and more developed, there's less industrial, there's less harm to the environment. That always, turns out only to be true for, uh, for sulfur dioxide. It turns out that the more developed an economy, the more pesticides, the more toxic substances, the more compromised to air pollution, the more compromised to water. So it is the more of this that you have, the development, and we, we, we show the data that shows that the more development you have, the way we're doing things today, uh, the more environmental problems. And then if you bring in the fact that it's not only domestic savings, but importing of products and importing of, of, of financial capital can make even more industrialization or certainly the importation of products which are harmful to the environment. And then finally, if you've got a large amount of capital, financial capital flow, uh, which is the case in the US, you're gonna have much more development, providing of course there are people to buy the material. So these three factors are the things that relate economic activity to the environment. But of course there is a reverse effect. If you decide you wanna regulate these things, there has been the question of whether regulation will hurt the economic system. And contrary to popular uh, cries about how regulation kills jobs and regulation kills innovation, it turns out our work here at MIT and elsewhere, uh, Michael Porter at Harvard shows that, that health and safety regulation actually improves innovation. It improves it in all kinds of mechanisms. So uh, you know, if you believe that regulation harms economic growth, then that's not what the facts say. So we do this to control, to, to, uh, to really track the effects of the economy on the environment. Ultimately, of course, we're gonna say, well, what do you wanna do about it? But that comes later. Now the economy, which reflects improvements in competitiveness, productiveness, the use of all kinds of capital and labor displacement and capital relocation and the changes in finance, 
All of these things <coughs> change what is made where, in which country, in which industries, and changes them in the nature of work. And what are those changes that we should be concerned about? Of course, the predominant reportable change is a change in wages, but wages is not the whole story. It's also the number of jobs. We may have a low unemployment rate in the United States, but if you ask how many people have rejoined the workforce at a fraction of the wage that they had before, it's a lot of people. Actual wage earning power has stagnated or reduced. So the skills, the wages, the purchasing power, job security, I already mentioned very quickly that over 50% of the jobs now are not permanent jobs. They're very insecure jobs. And there's health and safety compromises and the question of how meaningful the work is. So these are all the things which justify separating work from the economy. As far as the industrialists are concerned, it's just the number of workers and the wages that they're paying. But work is much more meaningful. Now, if we've got pull on the system, which says, look, you've got an environmental problem, you've got to do something about it. You've got underemployment, you've got to do something about it. Well, one thing is if you, if you just want to create more jobs, so you have uh, infrastructure gains or you find ways to produce more work, you will increase the environmental footprint. So you can increase this problem without changing what it is exactly you're doing and you'll have an environmental deficit. Or you can control the environment and that will impact employment. You'll have less coal miners, you'll have less steel workers. And so uh, there, these things also relate work to the environment and it is a two-way street. So this is the structure in which we define in the book, and we hope that those of you that will be teaching this course will get into the nitty gritty, what exactly is the changes in technology and job, uh, job utilization that affects the environment, the economy, and the work. Okay, so the myth, while energy and environment will command, obviously, a prominent place in sustainability, decisions, it's meaningful and rewarding employment with adequate purchasing power or otherwise increasing the earning capacity that is likely to dominate the debate over the next decade or two. If you look to see what's happening in France today, the dissatisfaction with ordinary citizens in terms of where they sit, it really is related to the fact that they do not like the changes in the economy. This is a reminder from Magritte's uh, painting, if you know it. It says this is not a pipe, it's a drawing of a pipe. And in a sense, uh, you know, our book is not just a textbook. It is a resource which allows you to teach with conviction, uh, to move beyond markets and act as a trustee for minority interests. Government is essential. There are those that never include government and think you're gonna just persuade people to consume less. Uh, we're not as optimistic about that as, and you need an integrated regulatory, industrial, employment, and trade policy. You can't deal with one thing at a time. And the transformation that will bring this about requires law and regulation, rules, enforcement, of course, economic and tax levers, but it involves government intervention. Anybody who thinks that we don't already intervene in the market needs to go back to the second slide. We already have environmental uh, interventions through subsidies and credit and finance. It's the wrong kind of uh, government involvement. This is what we need. And the book provides a framework uh, to have you look at those issues. And let's go, if we go to the next slide, we'll see what these, there are six parts to the book. Let me just uh, tell you what they do so those of you that want to teach this material might teach things that you otherwise not, may not be attractive. First of all, why are we concerned and how did sustainable development emerge as an international concern? It's from the first economic, the environmental conference uh, in, in 1970 in Montreal to the recent Rio conferences. But what this does is takes a historical and a present view on where are we at? Why do we have a crisis? Part two 
teaches from both a conventional perspective and from the perspective of new economics, uh, what economic development is about. Half of chapter three deals with current theory, and then the other half deals with the new way of looking at economic development, including the, the observation of Robert Ayers, which is all periods of growth have been due to inexpensive and easy access to energy. Here's the query. Do you think we're going to continue to have easy and non-volatile access to energy? I think not. Now, if you look at economic development from a country which is not involved in trade, and that was the case historically, that's very different than looking at an effect of a globalized economy. Because there you've got trade flows, you've got financial faculty flows, you've got, uh, you've got physical, faculty of, um, physical factors which flow, and a globalized uh, set uh, industrial system is a very different system than the one which pictures the economic production as within a, only within a country. And we end up looking at the effect of all walking around the triangle, which we did in a few slides back. Look at to see what has globalization and sustainability actually brought. If you didn't want to teach chapters three and four, but you just wanted to have a bird's eye view of what has all of this development and trade brought, chapter five is what you would teach. And it would be basically documenting the changes that have occurred. Now, what do you do about it? Well, part of it relies on so-called industrial policy. Classical industrial uh, technological innovation reflects the preferences of the, EU, of the EU and the US government that thinks, that thinks that innovation and research is gonna solve the whole problem. I'd have to say coming from MIT, I think that's the cradle of MIT as well, that they believe that technology will solve whatever problem you want, the technological displacement is not a reality, but it is a reality. And so there's the government, uh, and that's what goes on in the firm. There's how the firm is organized and whether we can have new kinds of firms created or we're gonna be stuck with the incumbents. And then a real look at a government policy in terms of how to foster innovation, economic growth, and employment. We have to have policies which also foster employment. One of the exercises I give my class is I tell them, suppose you weren't concerned with employment and you just wanted to create an environmentally sustainable economy, what would you do? You might look at the, um, at the energy content and where you get your energy from and the circular economy. And I, you might see the growth of this industry or the growth of that industry, which would produce better environmental consequences and better economic growth. But then I asked them, what effects do they have on employment? And as you would imagine, some growth policies enhance employment, some of it doesn't have much effect, and some of it destroys employment. And so if you don't take into account employment, environment, and economic development, you're dealing with two of the three major determinants of sustainability, and that's a way to get them to pause, to look at this third factor. Now, for those of you that don't teach environmental law or don't think you know enough to teach it, you might think about getting some of your colleagues that do know it because both domestic environmental law, regional European law, and international law, and let me remind you about the Paris Accords, have a tremendous impact on what the economy looks like, whether or not uh, the standards exist. We did not finalize a trade agreement with the, with, the, with the Europeans because we couldn't agree on lowering our regulatory standards. The Europeans did not want to lower. And by the way, in many cases, the Europeans are now very far ahead of regulating substances like the REACH initiative instead of Tosca. So uh, you, have to, you have to take into account the powerful role that regulation does in making a market for innovation. It defines what is reasonable to expect, both in the context of energy problems and toxic substances. And then trade law. You can't leave trade law out. Right now, the, uh, the, the uh, um, tariffs that, uh, tra that, that Trump wants to put on uh, products for steel and metals, 
they're actually illegal, then he can't do it. He's not going to be able to do it. He has, he and his ilk have no consciousness of what you can do once you sign the World Trade Organization. Of course, there are people who think he wants to get out of the World Trade Organization, out of NAFTA or well, so called revised NAFTA, who gave China carte blanche in the Asia Pacific region because he pulled out of the TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. He is, we're doing nothing with our European partners in terms of reaching an agreement. And trade turns out to be an unbelievably important part. Initially, there was technological displacement that accounted for most, most a loss of employment. And then the issue of exporting jobs to China and other places took over as a major source. Both are important. You have to address both trade regimes and employment policy if you really want to deal with the issue of employment. And then we have a chapter, which we'll talk about in a minute, on, uh, on and energy, because you couldn't deal with this issue if you didn't uh, deal with energy. I've lost the slides. Are you there? Yes, can you see it still? Well, I can see it, but it's not. It, it, you, you've left the book. Yes. You want to? You, okay. I want to go. Yeah, I want to go back because the point is that we're going to deal with, and it will show a very short version. I did. I had done for the European Commission uh, answered the question of whether their policies were uh, supportive of deep decarbonization or not, and whether you needed new innovation and you, the. the what we found may surprise you because everybody thinks that you need new innovation to solve the energy problem. You don't. We have the technologies, but there are people standing in the way. And then finally, and we talked about that when we talked about the matrices, we need to give you, don't ever listen to anybody describe a problem if they don't offer solutions. It's so easy to describe the problem. What's a little bit harder is to identify the options. And that took us a lot of time and we give very extensive discussion of how you, what the pathways to sustainability really are. You may agree with some, you may not agree with others. Some are well established, some are questionable. But you need a you need a dialogue. You need a narrative about where we go from here. Because I can tell you one thing: we don't go business as usual. It's not going to work. There are people here at MIT that believe that artificial intelligence will create enough employment, and we don't need to worry about. Uh, the, we don't need to worry about the, uh, the displacement. That's not going to be the case. Whatever optimism you have, you should get rid of that. Because, or if you don't want to get rid of the optimism, are you so certain that we shouldn't plan for other ways to uh, reach sustainability? Okay, Ralph, is this a place where I turn this back to you? Um, we could, but I mean, we can. Um carry on and you've done a really good job of summarizing some of these ideas already. So I'm okay, let, time. All right, let me, let me go ahead a little bit. Um, one question which you'll want to ask is who, what motivates anybody to innovate the private sector and who supplies the capital? There's this famous difference between technology push and market pull. About two thirds of innovation comes because of a need to satisfy an unmet need in the market or by government collectivizing the risk, for example, or uh, providing potable water. You know, in Flint, Michigan, the water can't be drunk. There's a lot of other places in this country where there's lead in the water supply. One's going to have to do something about that problem. It is an unmet need. And then the question, which is perennial, asked, says, can the government pick winners? And every industrialist you ask will say no, except the ones that have benefited from their picking winners. Aircraft, computers, chemotherapeutic agents, the government has been a major developer of the early stages of the technology. And I refer to Mariana Mazzucato's work called the entrepreneurial state. Government has a major role to play in kickstarting risky technology. And another way it can develop technology is by offering government purchasing, both at the state level and at the federal level. It may surprise you that Ralph Nader is one of the people who pushes state involvement in government purchasing. If you get the Postal Service to deliver the mail 
through a bidding process which chooses the best electric vehicles will create a mini market for electric vehicles which could really jumpstart the electric car industry. I mean, if you're going to be willing to buy 10,000 go-karts to deliver the mail, imagine what that would do to the small car market. And then recognizing that regulation makes a market by collecting, rising public demand and such standards. And uh, while some people may be categorically against regulation as a knee-jerk response, it, you have to have the targets of the future development established. It cannot be just a laissez-faire uh, problem. Okay, uh, the next slide. Again, well, this we did this, I think. Okay, we talked about the partnerships and the problem with regulations. Uh, the next one. Okay, well, what can you do about trade agreements which are not right? First of all, uh, you need domestic policy to compensate job loss. If you're going to if you're going to import products because it makes economic sense, you can't just leave the workers to fend for themselves. And we have to stop pursuing trade agreements that protect returns to the owners of capital while undercutting, undercutting wages. You know, people say that there is a Ricardo element here that, that both, this, both the, the importers and the exporters benefit from trade uh, under the comparative advantage theory. I'll tell you who benefits from trade. It's the importers and the exporters, not the governments in those countries. So you have to be careful if you're replacing labor, if you are bringing in environmentally unsound products. And we have to reorient our international policy against away from regressive trade agreements <coughs> and toward measures that will benefit workers in the US. Trump is not doing that. He is not doing that. He's basically protecting uh, the, 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 the private sector. You know, these jobs will not be created by his policies, as I've indicated, which the analysis, and we, we give you that analysis, it's basically illegal. You cannot do what Trump is doing under word, world trade rules. Okay, next slide. Okay, here is a, a kind of a star diagram of the work that I did for the European Commission. There's a lot of mythologies about energy. And let me, let me go through one at a time. One mythology is it's possible to realize mutual gains in industrial competitiveness, that means market share and profit, reduction of greenhouse gases and employment. You actually cannot have all three. You can't have all three. You either have to reduce corporate profit or you have to reduce employment. <coughs> or you have to do none of those by not reducing greenhouse gases. I mean, any analysis will show you, you can't have your cake and eat it. Myth number two, technological innovation in products and services is essential to achieving deep decarbonization. Europe, and by the way, the US too, is suffering from an innovation deficit. Not true. Me, and I, I referred to earlier work by Sokolov and more recent work from the Dutch, even not using nuclear, we have the technology today to make the the, 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 the Paris Accords, we have the technologies today to get below 1.5 degrees, but they're not held by people who control the economic agenda. Have we stopped the subsidies to fossil fuels? Have we stopped the control of the economic agenda and the trade agenda by the fossil fuel industry? The answer is no. Agriculture is the same problem. So we are not excuse me, we are not lacking in technological innovation, we're lacking in technological deployment of available technologies, both in Europe and the United States. I don't say innovation wouldn't help and make things cheaper, but we don't need it to achieve these things. Third myth, that innovation per se fuels the industrial state and create jobs. Actually, innovation is destroying jobs. It used to be that innovation, when it was associated with increases in energy efficiency, could do that. But that's not the case anymore. Innovation, which is MIT's watchword, don't believe that innovation is the answer. You know, some innovation, selective innovation, 
but not across the board. Myth number four, governments cannot pick winners. I've already talked about that. And people say, well, winners pick governments. No, governments can pick winners. They've done it time and time again. And the, uh, the cylinder of bankruptcy under Obama, which was criticized very heavily, misunderstands the fact that if you want government to, to deal with um, risky technologies, you've got to have failures as well as successes. If you have no failures, you won't get significant successes. Say, if anyone who knows innovation policy understands why you cannot have 100% impact uh, innovation-wise by funding industry. You'll just end up funding the things they would have bought anyway. Would have invested in it. Next slide. In industrial policy is synonymous with innovation policy. In a sense, of course, it is not true that industrial policy that will help sustainability has to be integrally connected to increasing innovation. Some innovation we need, some innovation we definitely do not need. So we have to stop equating these things, which unfortunately, Juncker, as well as the US policymakers believed in, both on the right and on the left. Technology number six. Regulation inhibits beneficial innovation. Absolutely wrong. Both the work of Porter at Harvard and our group here at MIT has shown absolutely no doubt about the fact that you get environment saving and worker protection out of regulatory initiatives that will herald better kinds of technology. This is a mythology which continues to be voiced. Second, another mythology, number seven. Carbon leakage, which means the fact that other countries will, will import into this country products which are not taking care of energy. And therefore, there's a limit to what we might do. If we wanted a carbon tax, the argument is, well, but, but the Chinese will import refrigerators and cars without taking care of the environment. The World Trade Organization allows us to put a tariff at the border. We can keep the Chinese refrigerators out if we want to make refrigerators in an energy sensible way in this country. The World Trade Organization is poised to allow you, but of course you have to treat all nations the same and you have to know what you're doing. Uh, and, and, and this the issue that, that, that the rest of the world will flood us will, with energy uh, damaging products uh, and we, there's nothing we can do about it is absolutely wrong. People don't understand the trade rules if they say that. Myth number eight, trade in non-energy related goods and services is a win-win proposition. No, it's not a win-win proposition. Some people win and some people lose. Sometimes it's the environment that wins, sometimes it's the worker employment issue, but trade benefits people involved in the business of trade, not necessarily the partners to trade. You have to you have to have some sophistication. I'm, I've gone to many meetings at MIT where, where energy is talked about. Nobody says anything about trade. They, they say not a word about trade. They say, well, how would it be good if we had a carbon tax? But nobody raises the question, what are you going to do about the Chinese refrigerators? What are you going to do about the parts that are coming in, ignoring energy and using coal? You can do something about it, but don't you think the question is necessary? Finally, the ninth mythology, which is nations can do it alone. Actually, in spite of Trump, we can't do it alone. The deglobalization movement that he is fostering, and some European countries are fostering, that individuals can do it alone, we don't need to do it together, is absolutely fraught with difficulty. We have to have international agreement. We have to have the sharing of technology. We can make the uh, energy problem uh, a practical, hand in fact, but we have to cooperate and we have to use trade as a mechanism. Okay, uh, at that point, shall I give it back to you, Ralph, or not? I don't remember. Sure, sure. Let me well, let me let me take over to to give you a bit of a rest for a moment. Um, what oh, we yeah, have here oh, yeah. is um, a graph of of the 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 pledges that were made by the US and China to reduce um, carbon emissions from energy. And what you can see here is that when this was done, the United States was on a, a trajectory of, of downward decline, and it looked like China was going to peak at around 20.
2030 um, in terms of reducing its emissions from energy. And so you could look at this and say, well, you know, China needs to, to make some significant reductions in what they're doing, but you need to step back a moment and look at other data in the context of this. What the graph on the right shows here is the trade in goods in 2016. And what you can see is, you know, China's, the imports from China are about four times what is coming out of the US in terms of exports to China. So there's an embodiment of um, carbon emissions in the goods and services perhaps that are coming to the US from China. So you, you may, if you look at the graph on the left, you need to take that into account that, that we are consuming um, these, uh, this volume of, of uh, carbon emissions through the products and services that come into the U.S. So if that's we took, uh, if we took this we took this graph and subtracted the goods that were sold to the West. This well, the graph wouldn't look like this at all. I mean, should we allocate the cost of emissions to China for products that are, are bought by the U.S.? I say no. China will look like this, and the U.S. will look like that. So you, we allocate the blame to the wrong person. Go ahead. Right. Nick, do you want to say a few words about the deconstructing growth? Well, structure? just, just as, a, as a kind of a sort of uh, ending point, uh, we've been talking about growth. People have some a have advocated degrowth, which is a, a term that people don't like. But let's deconstruct what growth is all about. And we have to ask, what are we talking about? What kind of growth are we talking about? First of all, aggregate growth in products and services that consume energy and materials is a concern. So we ought to de-emphasize GDP and productivity. We need to decouple physical growth, not from environment, but from profit. You can pay industry more money to produce less goods more environmentally sound goods in water policy in the Southwest in the United States. We, the more water you use, not the lesser it costs you, but the more it costs you. So we ought to decouple physical growth from profit. We want to make it profitable to sell less, to sell more environmentally sound. That takes a change in regulation and uh, the tax code, but that can be done because the present tax code represents a, a, an agenda capture by those that are gaming the system. Secondly, right, the growth in profits, which now is tied to subsidies, tax treatment of investor and profit, and the provision of producer and consumer credit, we have to change it. We talk about eliminating the subsidies to agriculture and to uh, fossil fuel, but they're still there. The tax incentives are still there. There's a, the, whole, the whole issue of antitrust is ignored in this country. Bill Gates was taken before the anti-monopoly uh, directive in Europe, but we, 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 we basically uh, uh, eliminated the lawsuits in this country. We don't take monopoly dominance seriously in this country. The growth in trade, which really invites people to produce things in, in a non-environmentally sound way, got to change the tax rules, the trade rules, as I said. You've got to make border adjustments. You should tax the products that are made in a non-environmentally sound. There's no reason why we can't do that, except, of course, the industry that's importing and making money from that importation isn't going to like it. But if we want to, to have an even, even, even trading field, we have to do that. We do have to have some uh, about something about the, the fact that, that the economy is so unequal. There's a, there is the, between the, the gap between those that have and those have not is increasing. So we have to somehow encourage what is called sufficiency. That is, this is enough. I don't need more space than that. I don't need to have four cars. I don't need to transfer all of my wealth to my, to my uh, son. And by the way, Piketty's work on wealth shows that almost all the wealth goes from within the family from one generation to another. Now, you know, if you're not one of those families, you're not benefiting from that. The next uh, item, 
is there is a growth in both underemployment, people joining the workforce at a fraction of the wage, and actual unemployment. Okay, if you only look at this, looks like 4% unemployment is really great. Doesn't count the people who aren't looking for jobs, doesn't count the people who accepted a lower wage. One of the things that we've recommended is that you keep the same pay, but you work a shorter number of hours. And I actually, we have data that show that workers in a plant in New Jersey, in a firm in New Jersey, in, in New Zealand, actually produce more by working four hours, four days for five days pay than they were. Go ahead. I think that graph shows that, right? Maybe not. Okay, now we have said, and I hope we could persuade you that the real problems occur in purchasing power and the demand side and the number of jobs with adequate capital. And so what do we suggest you consider? Transfer wealth, which has been talked about through uh, the universal uh, income uh, provision or tax, change the tax schedule Change it from capital owners and highly paid workers to those that are unemployed or underemployed. This country has an enormous maldistribution between high paid people and low paid people. You could think about universal basic income, you could think about a negative income tax, job guaranteed employment, a whole variety of mechanisms to change the ownership of capital. Secondly, you could jumpstart the economy with infrastructure. We'll see whether this Congress does any of that. Of course, that's a temporary measure. There are only so many potholes you can fix and so many bridges you can paint, but it would be certainly a good way to start injecting productive capital back into the economy. <coughs> Third, you could again have a shorter work week, but reduce the pay. The workers aren't gonna be thrilled uh, about that. That's why the next one, <coughs> is one of the things that's really likely to work. And this is a reference to New Zealand. Four day work week at the same pay ended up producing more productivity, more production by the workers. Should that surprise anybody? Think about the work that you're doing. Could you do it in four days? Of course you could do it in four days. You know, we haven't changed the work week since Henry Ford shortened work day from six to five days so people would buy his cars. Well, we're at the same place today. People aren't able to buy the cars or whatever the industrial system is making. So I, we have argued in a long uh, piece of work which has been published and quoted that um, you actually can maintain the productiveness of the nation by maintaining work parity and by shortening the work week, you can hire more of the unemployed. Next. Limit the, uh, limit the elimination of jobs during economic downturns, borrowing this thing called Kurzarbeit, short work uh, that the Germans have adopted. What they do is industry contributes to a fund, which, is, which sits there, but then when the demand goes down, rather than firing the workers, they pay the workers out of this fund. So you even out the ups and downs of unemployment. And the German success has been enormous. It's been uh, documented by The Economist, if you care to look at that. And basically speaking, uh, the, the, the great volatility in the work and uh, the work sector is not what it is in other countries. It works. We could do it. Next. Increase labor's contribution and therefore it's claimed on the profits from production. At MIT, we know how to design work out of the industrial process. We know how to design work out of services. A little bit of AI here, a little bit of computers there, and we can eliminate the work completely. How about thinking about redesigning and upskilling work back into the production process? And as um, Herman Daly says, if we don't want pollution and we want labor, how come we're taxing labor and not taxing pollution? I mean, he said this a long time ago. It's still true. For every hundred dollars of salary, you pay 150 with the benefits. You could collect that from industry, but not on a per worker basis. There's a fraction of sales or a fraction of profits. 
But we are not dealing with the factors of production in the industrial society in a way which is going to benefit the right people. And that's because we've been around a long time and it was working for a long time. As long as increased production led to increased wages, nobody complained. That's not the case anymore. Next slide. Next item. Meet human needs in a less expensive and less resource way. By redesigning product, this is a circular economy issue. Nobody disagrees that using less energy and using less materials wouldn't be a good thing for the environment. You gotta make sure that you don't lose jobs in the process, which means you have to integrate your jobs policy with your industrial policy. Next slide. Change the nature of consumer and human-centered demand. This is the toughest thing. Getting people not to buy SUVs, which is what they're doing now, can't be done because you're gonna to appeal to their better nature. I mean, we are relegating the small car market entirely to China. We're going to import all the small cars that people are willing to buy from China. We've closed the factories that produce small cars. Is this, is this crazy? What we should do is tax the hell out of SUVs just because we feel less guilty because they have hybrid systems. There's no reason why we have to be transported from A to B in a large vehicle with one driver per vehicle, one occupant per vehicle. I mean, this is a question of government policy and government will. You know, should we do, do we have to bend to the desire of people to buy bigger cars, bigger houses, snowmobiles, uh, you know, fly to far off places for destination weddings? This is a cultural change and very hard to change. However, Tax and economic policy can change it overnight. You can make it very difficult for people to afford the SUVs, and we should. It flies in the face of our Paris commitments. Promote the creation of a cooperative economy to broaden ownership. Now, many people have talked about inclusive capitalism. We should pool our money to create hospitals, pool our money to create schools instead of buying tobacco and alcohol and so forth. And there are mechanisms, except the only problem is that, um, you know, if a family is saving to buy up a house and they want a, the best return on their cash in the bank, they're going to buy tobacco and alcohol. They're not going to buy the promotion of a hospital for which they cannot benefit all because <coughs> it's for the community. Unless we change the dividend and tax policy on those investments. I mean, does the, municip the municipal governments can sell tax-free bonds? Why not have public investments sell tax-free bonds? And the answer is because the municipal bond sellers don't want it. They don't want any competition that might help people as opposed to corporate profit. I'm sorry to be what really sounds like nasty, but that's the fact. And then finally, if you really want to enable the increased ownership. You know, think about a different way of financing. Uh, my brother, Robert Ashford, who has contributed immensely from this, has persuaded me that people rarely do people make enough money from working. They have, to, they have to work. Many rich people make money from owning, not from working. So why not let ordinary people have a dual income from both working and from ownership of capital? And I'm not talking about owning the firm that you're working for. I'm talking about have a bigger role in investing in the national economy uh, and, you know, target capital investment on inherently um, sustainable goods. You could give people universal income, uh, which will not change the distribution of uh, capital. People, the rich are afraid that you're going to take money from them. Well, Maybe we should, but we won't, you don't have to use this mechanism to do it. We just need to get it. Everybody needs to have a dog in this fight. And what is the fight? The fight is to achieve a sustainable society, which we're rapidly losing hope of achieving. So let me stop there. And if it's not too late, uh, take some questions. 
Well, my thanks to both of you, Nicholas and Ralph. That was a truly impressive, sweeping presentation. I uh, really appreciate the integrated approach that uh, you've taken here. Um, there were a few points that you both made throughout the presentation uh, that, uh, while they may not be central to uh, your uh, presentation today, I thought I would see if the, you could add some additional comments uh, on a few of these. Um, <clears throat> one, early on in the presentation, you talked about the fragmented knowledge base and I was curious if you uh, would like to add any comments about the implications of that. Uh, also earlier in the presentation, you mentioned the circular economy and later in the presentation, you came back to that and I am interested in your take on the current buzz on the circular economy and if you think there's more to it than just buzz. And uh, I guess another uh, point uh, earlier in your presentation was uh, the need to decrease unsustainable growth. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, say a bit more about that. Well, maybe I should make a comment about the circular economy because that's easy. Uh, circular economy doesn't take into account labor at all. It just talks about the environmental consequences of energy and material. And I, I fault it for not integrating itself with labor policies. Because you can imagine a circular economy where you have a, a loss of purchasing power and employment. And that is a very myopic and dangerous position to take. None of the, I teach my students, and I think Ralph does as well, everything is connected to everything else. If you leave any of these issues out, you may be very surprised. So let me turn it over to Ralph to answer whatever of the other two questions he wants. Sure. I mean, this is connected also to the, the fragmentation of the knowledge base. I mean, one of the things I hope um, the listeners have, have take, will take away from this is the, the breadth of what we're doing is intentional to try and to try and bridge the silos of knowledge, right? So you know, when we put up that view of the structure of the book, you get a sense of the focus on innovation theory, organizational theory, the role of regulation at the national level, the regional level in Europe, at the international level through multilateral environmental agreements. There's how do you finance development and growth. Um, all of these uh, um, areas of thinking and knowledge need to be connected. And the challenge is when you come at this from a teaching perspective, it is very difficult to, to cover everything in an integrated way. And so what we've been trying to do in this book is, is map things out. Um, one of the teaching approaches I think that both Nick and I use are to use assignments to, to try and help students build their own mental model or framework of how you connect ideas. Um, and we, where we uh, are teaching a, a particular area of knowledge that we're not experts on, we will bring in the experts. Um, so, you know, I'll have Nicholas call into my class and cover uh, European law, for example. So I think there's a need to kind of to take on the challenge um, in teaching sustainable development in a way that really does integrate domains of thinking. Um, and so, and Nick, do you have anything to add on that? Well, I think the fallback position is if you are overwhelmed by what you would have to know to teach your students, the book is organized in such a way that you can be very selective, teach chapters one, three, five, seven, and 11, you know, and, and, and either relegate the rest to another class or, uh, you know, to their own reading. But uh, you don't have to go from page one to page 720. You can select. The issues that you, for example, and I'm not picking on that for any particular reason. If you don't think you want to spend time talking about the the, um, uh, the environment conference in 1970 and Rio and what's wrong with Rio plus five and Rio plus ten, you could leave those international agreements out, and you still would be able to have uh, integrity for the rest of the stuff. Um, you don't have to go through. Chapter three and four, which is the nitty gritty of how development occurs in isolation or as part of the um, 
part of the uh, international uh, globalized effect. If you assign chapter five, chapter five will tell you the the the, the, the sum the the, the 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 summary of of how development and what concerns there are. So you can you can be selective. Um, I would probably not urge you to leave trade law out. I think it's terribly important. Uh, you have a hard time leaving energy out. But I think, you know, one or one could go to the law school or go to political science department if one were not teaching in that realm and ask if they could teach that chapter. This is, this is really a transdisciplinary effort. And uh, it's meant either to be uh, uh, taught by several people or somebody who has done the work to, uh, to make themselves transdisciplinary. I mean, it took us <clears throat> a full decade. I had to learn a lot that I didn't know uh, between the first and the second edition of the book. I think we finally got it right, but I would love to have other people's experiments and experience with it. Mm -hmm. So the other question was about unsustainable growth. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the 10 options that have been put out here are not necessarily directly addressing that. I mean, you could you could think about perhaps redesigning the way we think about the problems. Perhaps number point seven, um, one of the things we, we talk about throughout the work is this need to broaden and open up the design space. So rather than just think about um, addressing an environmental concern in, in a problem, you, you address the environmental, the worker health and safety uh, and other dimensions. So you broaden the design space a little bit. So you end up with multi-purpose solutions. So I think, you know, you could have that as one element of a strategy to tackle unsustainable growth. So you, you could actually have the throughput economy as one of the variables you're, you're thinking about. Um, how will the work, the, the, the good or service you're providing have an impact um, in terms of increasing throughput? So, I, I mean, I, I think um, the last point here about targeting investment is also important. So if you were to target investment mechanisms on inherently sustainable approaches, I think that would have a major impact in shifting attention and focus um, on how people invest in, in economic development. Um, Nick, anything else to add on that? Well, I'm, I, I mean, degrowth is a, is a war cry from people who noticed that the Western countries have, you know, consumed such an enormous percentage of energy and materials. The truth is, and we say this, some people consume too much and some people don't consume enough. And the, the, the one trick is, is, to, is to discourage consumption at the high end in order that the essential goods be consumed. Now, you can do this by, by integrating your policies. I think the hardest thing to do <clears throat> is to change Americans from wanting to buy SUVs without regulation and without tax incentives. You, I mean, people are not just going to do it. They want the big one. They want the ice crushing machine. They want to be able to get the uh, ice cubes out of the refrigerator without having to open up a tray. I mean, this is the hardest thing to change, but it's not the only way to change things. I don't think you, I, I, there, was a, there was a scholar who, who we quote, it says rather than degrowth or growth, I would like to have policies created which would be called a growth. That is, don't focus on growth, focus on what you want. Focus on controlling the environmental problems. Focus on creating employment. If you do that, you don't have to worry about growth. But uh, you know, this is a subject for debate. Some of it's cultural, some of it is uh, you know, flag waving. But uh, what the degrowth people have done to their credit, because they've opened up the debate about well, what kind of growth do you want? Sustainable growth, uh, you know, uh, less environmentally harmful growth, the job creating growth. You can have all those things, but you can't do it all with the same policy. Very good. I. Um want to respect the fact that one of our attendees, Jack, has uh, been patiently posting comments throughout. And uh, I think as a final question, let me um, 
refer you to his last post in the chat box. He says, can you explain the externalities generated by the inheritance of wealth? To me, passing down wealth from generation to generation seems like a good thing and the only proven way to generate economic freedom under our current system. For example, grandparents contributing to their grandchildren's college educations through inheritance. I imagine you, like Piketty, have a notion of a threshold of wealth that is much higher than that example. However, the selection of that tipping point strikes me as difficult to do reasonably without violating individual rights. Okay, that, uh, very good question. Um, first of all, you have to understand, I'm sure you do, that, that, that the agenda in government is basically controlled by probably the upper one-tenth of a percent of the wealthiest. I mean, there's, there's work to be quoted by Gillens and Page, two political scientists from uh, Princeton, that talk about the fact that American people get what they want about 6% of the time out of, out of government, that the extremely wealthy get what they want 94% of the time. I think this is, I think this is a very important issue. Uh, when... Andrew Carnegie and Ford created the basis for American industry. <clears throat> their money and their wealth went towards investment and innovation. That's not where wealth is going today. Wealth is going in terms of buying assets, which are not productive assets. So uh, it isn't true. It just isn't true that the very wealthy are creating further wealth in the society. They're only creating further, further wealth artificially by buying back their own shares of stock, which bids up their paper wealth. And that creates a bubble. So uh, freedom, a very important issue. Uh, whenever government intervenes, you are compromising somebody's freedom. The question is, do we have a social contract which justifies that? In the Netherlands, where I lived for a year, the difference between the highest paid worker and the lowest paid worker in a firm was historically very small, much smaller than it is in the rest of Europe or in the United States. Now, do you need to have very wide disparities in wages, which means disparities in wealth as well? Obviously not. There are plenty of countries where that is. Japan is another example where the disparity between highly paid people and low, and, and if you even Talk about corporate payment. I mean, I'm not going to get into that, but I mean, it is in the hundreds of times uh, the, the the level of the engineer in those plants. I'm not talking about the janitor, but the engineer in those plants. Uh, I think the issue of wealth and its control on the political agenda is what the problem really is. Um, the Greeks have a saying. It says, if the suit they bury you in has no pockets, right? So the next best thing, I guess, is having pockets be give it to your grandson or give it to your son. But unless they are doing something productive with that wealth, that wealth is being taken uh, with bad effects on the rest of the society. That's what the that's what the distributional effects show. If everybody was getting better off, who cares if there's some people with all that wealth? But everybody is not getting well. There, there are sizable groups of people who are getting worse off while others are getting better. Now, <coughs> if our if our uh, questioner doesn't care about that, I'm not going to preach to him that he should care about it. But wealth is not what it used to be. It's not Carnegie Mellon's wealth. It's not um, Ford's wealth. It's not doing those things. Does that help at all? Very good. I, I'm looking at the uh, clock. Uh, given the lateness of the hour, I think we'll have to wrap things up on that point. Uh, thanks again so much, uh, Nicholas and Ralph. Uh, th this was a truly special presentation. I know that I'm going to need to go back and listen to parts of the recording again. Uh, there were so many uh, great points. And as you suggested, it's not the usual presentation on sustainable development. So uh, with that... Uh, thanks uh, to you both and to the attendees who've stuck with us to the end here. 
and um, we'll sign off for today. Can I ask you, just ask you a question? Sure. Yeah, I, I think because of the technical glitches, it's probably possible to edit the presentation to be half an hour shorter. Um, do you think the people who have open, listed in might like a second bite at the apple with, with an edited version without the glitches? What do you think? Well, uh, we'll try to take a shot at editing out some of the glitches in the recording. Um, uh, I, I sense, though, that uh, it, it, it all uh, played out very nicely in the end. But uh, we'll, we'll do what we can on the recording. The recording, of course, will be posted on the SEC website, and uh, we'll have that up in the next day or two. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a real, it, it helped us a lot solidify our own perspectives. I mean, uh, we continue to learn the more of this onion we peel away. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we all learned a lot today from your presentation. So thanks so much. Thanks, I appreciate it. Bye-bye.